This is FRM Part 1, Book 3, Financial Markets and Products, Trading Strategies Involving Options. Now, we've talked a little bit about trading strategies involving stocks and bonds. And what do we know? We know that investors like to buy lots of different stocks and lots of different bonds so that they form well diversified portfolios to increase or maximize their end of period wealth. Well, trading strategies involving options are just a little bit different. Remember that options generally, not always, but generally are short term. And so there are lots of strategies in which investors can use different types of options and different characteristics of options to generate some well established and well known future values. Let's go ahead and look at these learning objectives, just three of them. We'll talk about covered calls and protective puts payoffs and then a combination here. So let's go ahead and start with a covered call. This is a scenario under which an investor owns a share of stock. So if you're an owner of a share of stock, what kind of risk are you facing? Of course, there are tons and tons of risks out there, but it can be summarized by the simple fact that you can buy high and sell low. So if you own this stock, what you can do is you can couple it with a call option so that you can lock in some future value of the portfolio that consists of the stock and the option. So what you do is you own the share of stock and then you write the option. And there's a beautiful picture of what those profits look like that what you're doing here is if the stock price continues to go up, uh, that's a good thing for your ownership of the share of stock, but it's not so good as the writer of the call ops. And so, so notice that that's a horizontal line, horizontal to the horizontal axis. And so that's gonna be the maximum profit. And then what happens uh, as the stock price falls, what you do is you then gain the premium on that option because uh, uh, the owner of the option, the person who bought that option from you is not going to exercise that option when the price is lower. That makes perfect sense, right? If there's a, if, if they own the right, but not the obligation to buy that share of stock from you for $100 and the price is now $50, there's no way, there's no way they would buy it from you. So you get to keep that premium. So the maximum profit, there's a good formula to memorize. It's the uh, strike price minus the purchase price plus the option premium received. So there's the, the plus, that means that you get to keep it when the stock price falls. And of course, the maximum loss then is going to be the difference between the purchase price and whatever the stock price at expiration is. Uh, notice I put a zero in there, so if the stock price falls to zero, what happens is that you lose uh, you lose almost all of that, right? Now, for these reasons, a covered position uh, is motivated by uh, the possibility and the opportunity to generate cash. And you would only do this if you don't think that the stock price is going to rise. So if I go back here to that, go back here to that formula, I'm sorry, go back here to that uh, illustration. Um, if you own this share of stock and you thought that it was going to go up and then go up some more and then go up some more and then go up some more, you would never, you would never uh, enter into this covered call because then your uh, price appreciation would be capped. Hopefully that makes perfect sense. You would only do it if you think that the price is going to stay somewhat stable and maybe fall just a little bit. And remember, once that option expires, then you own that share of stock and then over the long term, you expect it to rise. So remember this covered call, you own the stock forever and ever, you only owe the option for one month or three months or six months, whatever, uh, whatever time to expiration on that particular option is. How about a protective put? If you remember in the last chapter, I gave you a table describing put call parity. And we had stuff on the left-hand side of the equal sign and stuff on the right-hand side of the equal sign. Well, the protective put was owning the share of stock and buying a put option. So you own the share of stock and you buy the put option. And what this does is if the stock price falls, if the stock price falls, then you lose by owning the stock, but you gain by, uh, by having the protective put. So you can exercise 
you can exercise that put option and you can get your money back, so to speak. So there's a good picture of this. Notice what the protective put does is that it, um, it establishes a boundary. It establishes a floor for the value of your portfolio. And then of course, notice that it goes up and to the right. So if the stock price continues to rise, right, you own the share of stock, that stock will increase in value and then the put will uh, expire worthless but you'll still get that upward uh, upward slope. Now, why would someone do this? Someone who owns the stock, you know, thinks that that is a uh, appropriate for the long-term strategy of the portfolio, but but there are near-term uncertainties. Near-term meaning 1 month or 3 months or 6 months. So what you're trying to do is protect yourself in the short term. Now, there are lots of other option strategies here. We can go the, go through these probably pretty quickly. There's something called a bull spread. Uh, so what do you think a bull spread is? You know, imagine that picture, not the picture, imagine the actual uh, bull right there on Wall Street. I've taken my students there many times. We have lots of pictures there, you know, right there in the corner of Wall Street and Broad Street, that bull is charging ahead. So um, with a bull spread, you would think that you would benefit when prices rise. And there, there's a picture of it, of course, there on the right. What happens is that if prices rise, you lock into a guaranteed profit. And if you lose, you, you kind of lock into uh, a guaranteed loss. So if you look at that, if you look at that illustration, you're only going to lose that much and you're only going to gain that much. But you do this so that you uh, mm -hmm. so that you win when when prices rise. Now, this is really a fascinating kind of an introduction to lots of these strategies. Those first two that we did, the cover call and the uh, protective put involved actual ownership of the underlying stock right here. This is not the case. So what we're doing here in a, in a bull spread uh, using call options, we're going to buy a call option with a lower strike price and at the same time sell a call option with a higher strike price. So our portfolio consists of just two call options. We're buying one and we're writing one. And it should make sense looking at the picture there on the right of the box. There's the A and the B. Um, we're buying the call option with the lower strike price. So we have the right but not the obligation to buy at the lower A, right? So we're probably going to pay more for that than we're going to receive as the premium if we sell if we sell the right but not the obligation to buy at that B, whatever that is, right? B is greater than A. All right, so there's a little box that gives this illustration here. If we buy one call option uh, for $5.50 and we sell one for $2, then that net cost is $3.50. The ma maximum profit that we can make is going to be the difference between the two exercise or strike prices. So in this case, it's what's that 105 minus 100 and then minus that premium. And then the maximum loss is going to be the net premium. Now you can do this with put options as well, but it's probably far more common for investors to use call options. So remember, when, when are you going to do this? You don't have to own the underlying stock, right? You do this when you expect, when you expect the underlying stock to increase in value, right? You're bullish. So you do this over the short term. And remember, you, you know, if you're going to bet on this with a bull spread over a two month options that it only works is if there's a, 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 a bull market in that two months. If it happens in two months and one day, then you're then you're back over to the left by the A on on that on that graph. And then, of course, there's the opposite of this. There's a bear spread. If you think the prices are going to fall, if you think the price of this underlying stock is going to fall, you just do the reverse. And when the prices fall, you win. So from A to the left, there's your profit. From B to the right, there's your loss. And so let me just toggle back and forth here really quick. So look at that picture there. There's the bull spread and then there's the bear spread. Uh, a butterfly spread, sometimes uh, sometimes called a condor spread, because if you look at that little picture there, does it does it look like a does it look like a butterfly or a bird? I don't know. You have to have some good imagination. I mean, even I can draw a bird that looks like that, and I'm a terrible drawer. 
Um, but what you do is you combine four options. So you buy an option with a lower exercise price, that's A. You buy uh, another option with a higher exercise price, that's C. And then you write two options at the uh, same exercise price. They, they have to be the same exercise price around B. And so what are you doing here? With a butterfly spread, what you're saying is that, hey, I think that this particular stock is going to stay exactly at its same value today, right? So if the stock price today is at B and you execute this butterfly spread for a month and after a month the stock price is B, then you have that maximum profit. Notice what happens that if, if the price goes either this way or that way, if there's some considerable volatility over that one or two or six month time period, then, then you lose out. But notice you lose out by the same amount, a butterfly spread. So the motivation is that uh, there's going to be, how about a 0% standard deviation? How about if we look at some other spread strategies? Let's talk a little bit about a calendar spread. So remember, you've got this share of stock, which you can own forever and ever, right? But the options then have specific expiration times, one month or two months or three months. So how about if you form a portfolio under which you put a call option in there that has one month to expiration and another call option that has three months or six months to expiration. All right, so this is what happens with a calendar spread. What you're going to do is you're going to uh, write the call option at the shorter end and you're going to buy the call option at the longer end. All right, so you got the same underlying asset. The only thing that's different, the only thing that is different is that they have one month and three months or six months, whatever it is. But remember, they also have to have the same strike price. So what happens is that the option that you bought with the longer time to maturity probably has more volatility to it. And so what you want to do is you want to benefit from that one and you want to benefit from the other one that you write that has shorter uh, time period with less volatility. So that one has less chance of being exercised. The call that you own has more chance of being exercised. A diagonal spread is pretty similar, but you have two different strike prices. And what this does is that it kind of spreads out that profitability over the difference between those two prices. How about a straddle and a strangle? This is kind of interesting, a straddle. Let's suppose that you are researching a particular company and you think this company is really going to change in value over the next three or six months, right? Let's take the classic example. Let's suppose that there's a company out there that is the target of a Department of Justice investigation. Let's suppose they're, they're being investigated for having a monopoly. And so this company then is parking lots and lots of cash on its balance sheet because uh, the court system might come along and say, yes, you're a monopoly. You owe every one of your customers $8.55. Multiply that by 10 million and you got all this money. So they'll have to pay that out. If this judgment it goes against this company, then stock price will fall, right? Because they're out the cash, they're a monopoly, they're going to be broken up, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But if the judgment comes in that company's favor, then they have all this cash that they can invest in positive net present value projects, then the stock price is going to soar. All right, so you're convinced that the stock price is either going to go way up or way down. All right, so this is when you uh, this is when you take a position called a straddle. You buy a call option and you buy a put option uh, with the same exercise or strike price and the same time to expiration. Of course, that time to expiration, in my example, um, would have to include the ultimate announcement of the court's decision. And so what happens? If the price goes way, way up, then the call option kicks in. If the price goes way, way down, then the put option kicks in. Of course, the put and the call, they're worthless on, on the other side of the transaction. But what do you care? All you did was pay that premium. You're willing to pay that premium because you don't know, you don't know what, uh, you don't know what is going to happen with the court judgment. So really here, what you're betting on in a straddle is that there's going to be lots and lots of volatility whether it's from a court decision or a merger or any other kind of a significant event. What's the worst thing that can happen if you have the straddle? The worst thing that can happen is that the stock price ends 
on the expiration date at the exact price as the strike price. And that's where you see the A, so it comes down to a little V. The most you can lose is the premium on the call and the premium on the put. Now, let's turn that on its head if you think that the stock price is going to stay exactly the same. For some reason, you just think this is gonna, this is gonna stay exactly the same. Well, then what do you do? You short the straddle instead of buying the call and buying the put, you, you do just the opposite. You sell the call and you sell the put, same exercise price, same expiration. And if the stock price then uh, ends up exactly on the strike price on the expiration date, then what do you do? You get to keep both of those premiums. But of course, notice what happens all the way out here and all the way out there. Uh, strangle is the exact same thing, except the, uh, except the put option has an exercise price that's lower than the exercise price on the call option. So instead of coming down to a V, you come down to like a little bucket or something. And so the strangle, what these things uh, rely on is even greater volatility, right? And they cost less. How about a couple other quick ones here? There are strips and straps and collars in which you can, you know, kind of tilt the angle of the V. You know, we were doing the upside down and the regular V and, you know, so you're just tilting this angle here. And a collar looks just like a, uh, just looks just like a, a bull spread. And how about the final uh, slide here, an interest rate cap and an interest rate floor. These are really, really cool things. Think about in the following manner. Let's suppose that you own a floating rate bond. So what are you doing? You are, you're receiving these coupon payments every six months. What happens if interest rates go down to zero? So you go out to your mailbox. Of course, you don't do this anymore. You go out to your mailbox and you say to the mailman or the mailwoman, hey, where's my, where's my coupon payment? And the mailman or the mailwoman has to say, well, you bought that floating rate bond. You should know that your coupon payment is now zero. Well, what you can do is you can layer the ownership of that floating rate bond uh, with an interest rate floor so that if interest rates fall below a certain number, the derivative kicks in and then the derivative market will then pay you uh, whatever that coupon payment is. And of course, you can have a cap or a floor. And so notice the bottom point there. Interest rate caps and floors provide protection against fluctuating interest rates. And that takes us through next up, exotic options.